Hello, everyone. My name is Philippa Lenzos. I'm a senior lecturer in war studies and co-director of the Center for Science and Security Studies. With me is Dr. Hassan Al-Batimi, also senior lecturer in war studies and co-director of the Center for Science and Security. Uh, welcome to this webinar. It's hosted by our center as part of the War Studies at 60's, uh, 60 seminar series. Um, we are delighted uh, to be joined by so many people, students, uh, staff, alumni, colleagues from outside of King's, um, and others interested in science and technology and international security. Thank you all for coming. The War Studies at 60 series celebrates 60 years of War Studies at King's by exploring key issues in security and defense. More details are available on our web pages, uh, which Lizzie should be popping into the chat uh, for you uh, soon. Uh, there's also a, a very fabulous commemorative publication that has been produced about the department at 60. And if you've not had a chance to flick through it, do take the opportunity. Uh, and again, the details of those um, uh, of that publication should be posted into the chat as well. Now, our aim today is to take an in-depth look at the big question of how emerging technologies are shaping, reshaping the security landscape. As many of you will be very aware, through the 20th century, the pursuit of national and international security was largely synonymous with the use of science and technology to design and deploy powerful weapons from the battleships and chemical weapons of the First World War to the radar systems and atomic bombs of the Second World War to the intercontinental ballistic missiles and nuclear arsenals of the Cold War. Scientists and engineers transformed the nature of warfare and by extension, global politics. Today, science and technology not only remain crucial to contemporary national and international security, but emerging technologies are advancing at extraordinary speeds with unprecedented and far-reaching impacts on the present as well as on future conflicts and warfare. Digital technologies are emerging um, alongside emerging technologies like machine learning and artificial intelligence, like nanotechnologies, genomic technologies, and cutting edge uh, biotechnologies, as well as additive manufacturing, space technologies, and the list goes on. Uh, all of these new technologies are um, refashioning a lot of old questions and raising new ones on the links between technology, society, uh, and global order. And I'll pass over here to my uh, colleague, Hassan, who will uh, continue with our introduction to the session. Hassan, please. Thanks a lot, Philippa, for uh, starting us off. Hello and welcome everyone um, once more. We're very delighted today to host three guest speakers um, to share their perspectives on how emerging technologies are influencing global security, drawing on insights from their work um, and research. Um, collectively, we hope that the panel can trigger reflections and discussion on how to approach an ever-changing technological landscape and its implications on how we define, but also address security challenges. What is the balance of risks and opportunities offered by new and emerging technologies? How to engage with the concept of disruptive technology with the connotations it holds of fast and radical change and assess its potential impact on the global order? Um, how can we think about effective means to control um, or dare I say, tame technological advances. These and others um, uh, will be some of the questions that we will discuss in today's uh, panel. Um, each of our three guest speakers will speak for 15 minutes. Um, this will be followed by a question and answer with our audience. Uh, we have a large number of attendees uh, today and we will endeavor to address all the questions within the time that we have. So please make sure to put your questions early in writing through the Q&A channel, not the chat channel. You'll find the Q&A channel at the bottom of your screen or in your Zoom window. These will be collected and put to the panel for comments and responses. And we aim to end our event at 8 p.m. Um, uh, GMT. 
Uh, please note that the panel is recorded and will be made available on our, uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, I encourage you all to keep an eye on our social media channels. We're using uh, Twitter hashtags, Emerging Tech uh, and War Studies 60. Uh, and you can venture even further by checking the Twitter handle for the War Studies Department and the Center for Science and Security Studies for additional content. All right, our first panelist is Sean Ekins. Uh, Sean is founder and CEO of Collabor Collaborations Pharmaceuticals, a drug discovery company focused on using machine learning approaches for rare and neglected disease drug discovery. Um, Ekins graduated from the University of Aberdeen, receiving his PhD in clinical pharmacology. Oops. Um, and DSC in science. He has authored uh, or co-authored more than 300 peer-reviewed papers and edited five books on different aspects of drug discovery research using computational approaches. Thank you so much, Sean, uh, for joining us today and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hassan and Philippa for the very kind introduction today. Um, I'm just going to share my slides. And, um, my presentation today, uh, I've titled Uncovering the Dark Side of AI-Powered Drug Discovery. And as a little bit of an introduction, um, I'm the CEO of a, a small pharmaceutical company, and this is literally one of hundreds that are using AI and machine learning uh, to do drug discovery. Uh, the outer circle uh, of this image uh, lists many of the companies globally uh, that are using AI in all different areas of drug discovery. Um, and we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of companies that are using these technologies over the last few years. Obviously, this did not just come out of um, nowhere. Um, the industries, uh, such as pharmaceutical industries, consumer products, and others, have been using artificial intelligence technologies for decades. Uh, but what we have seen is uh, obviously more of an integration and more powerful technologies being used as well as the increase in data that's become available and obviously uh, more powerful hardware as well. I think this is now what's driving uh, the integration towards more of a design make test cycle. Um, whereas in the past, we would have used these technologies individually for assessing molecules in terms of their properties or toxicity or even environmental impact, for example. And we are at the point now where there are a number of groups, academic um, and also companies that are focused on uh, creating uh, chemistry in a box. Uh, this is also known as autonomous synthesis or robot chemistry. Um, and, and this slide gives an idea of some of the different groups that are approaching this. And so the types of algorithms that we use for drug discovery um, are being integrated alongside the technologies to actually physically synthesize molecules. And you can imagine this as a totally integrated uh, loop um, where the scientist is basically um, minimally used or minimally invasive chemistry, you could call it. And so this is where the technologies are heading. And uh, our little company is really focused on using the data sets that we generate ourselves or we can curate from literature to build models in different areas that we can then apply uh, to assist in the drug discovery process. And these could be optimizing molecules to improve the properties, uh, avoiding certain toxicities, um, as well as other types of endpoints. So in the process of building these models, we've obviously had to generate uh, machine learning approaches, building our own software that we can then use um, internally as well as with uh, external companies. And so we do a lot of uh, fee-for-service work. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of uh, an idea of my background. And where we put a lot of emphasis is primarily on building models for toxicities. So trying to predict from a molecule structure whether a new molecule is going to be toxic um, uh, if it's going to hit a particular target, for example, or if it's going to show some acute toxicity in an animal model. And over the years, we've been able to put together lots of different uh, computational approaches and publish them. And this slide just shows some of those examples heavily focused on uh, the area of the acetylcholinesterase, which is both a drug target for diseases like Alzheimer's, uh, but also um, a target where um, 
molecules may uh, target in, in to have a desired effect as a uh, pesticide, for example. And so what we've been doing over the last few years is integrating these machine learning technologies with other tools for designing molecules in the computer. And this is called de novo generative design. And this schematic uh, gives you an idea of how we can use a database of molecules, for example, uh, from a widely available database like Kemble to train a machine learning algorithm and then use our models for various properties to optimize the molecules that will come out of this. And an example that we've uh, used to highlight the potential here uh, is a recent publication on a natural product called Ibogaine, uh, where the traditional medicinal chemists were trying to come up with new molecules that remove some of the liabilities of the molecule, such as cardiac toxicity, um, but retain some of the biological activities. And in the process of this work that was published in Nature last year by Cameron et al, uh, they identified this analog called tabernantolog. And we thought that this would be an interesting challenge to see whether our computational approach would be able to replicate what the traditional medicinal chemist would do. And so we would integrate our computational models and perform uh, an approach called multiple parameter optimization uh, to try to see if we could actually uh, replicate this. And what we found using our approach was that we could very rapidly uh, produce thousands of analogs, molecules that were obviously very structurally similar to Ibogaine, including tabernantolog shown here on this graphic on the top right, as well as many different structurally different molecules um, shown on the bottom middle of the slide. And so we can get a, quite a broad coverage of chemical space. And this next slide uh, just makes the point that we trained the model on this large database called Kemble, um, and we were able to look at desired activities against the receptor 5-HT2A, as well as undesired activities. So all of these represent machine learning models that are uh, input into our design model, and we can generate not only the molecule of interest, tabernantolog, but many other analogs with very similar properties. And so in total, we're able to produce over 100,000 molecules um, and the tabernantolog was in the top 50 of those molecules. So this proves uh, an example where a computer can actually make molecules that, that chemists would make themselves, but obviously um, traditionally making them physically. And so this brought me up to the point where I was introduced uh, into the field uh, that ultimately got me this invitation today to present as well. Um, I was invited to talk at a conference called the SPEES Convergence Conference, and they were interested in um, getting a presentation from me on how potentially these AI and machine learning technologies could be misused. And this was not something that I'd ever really uh, considered previously, uh, even though I'd worked on lots of infectious diseases and I'd worked on acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. The really um, interesting aspect of this for me was that I'd not really thought of the ethical underpinnings of what we were doing. And so we had a, a very short period of time to put together a presentation because I'd left it to the last minute. Um, and it gave me some, some time to think about the challenges we face in recognizing whether a molecule is, uh, can be used for good or for evil. And so this slide uh, hopefully will give you an idea of really how close molecules that are useful as pesticides are and how chemical weapons ultimately look very similar. Can you decide which side of this slide is pesticides versus chemical weapons? And unless you have a um, understanding of this field, you would probably have no idea which slide, which side of the slide, uh, but actually pesticides on the left-hand side and chemical weapons are shown on the right-hand side. So my challenge was, could we um, ultimately use the models that we build, but kind of flip them around? And instead of trying to find molecules that are not toxic, identify molecules that are more toxic. And so uh, this slide is what I presented at the conference. And uh, we used the generative approaches that I showed previously to try to make molecules like VX. And uh, what we are showing on this slide image on the right hand side is really the visualization of the molecules that were generated. Um, we were able to create in just uh, six hours over 40,000 virtual molecules. 
Um, the molecules in this blue color are molecules with known LD50s. Um, and VX is shown towards the bottom here as a purple dot. And the salmon colored molecules uh, are those that were created by the software. And so we were able to generate thousands of molecules, many of which were uh, known analogs of VX. Um, and we found these by comparing to databases. Um, and also a very large uh, distribution of these molecules were actually predicted to be even more toxic than VX and have potency against the acetylcholinesterase as well. So this was quite alarming that obviously we could create so many molecules virtually. Um, we never went to the point of obviously making any of these molecules, but in the process of the work, we basically had come up with the design cookbook of how to do this in the computer, how one could just take these technologies. Um, we could take the data sets that are uh, available in the literature from different databases. Uh, the software for generative tool design and, and machine learning is all open source. Um, and there are many other tools to predict the uh, synthesis routes of molecules called retrosynthesis software that are either commercial or open source. And obviously to go to the next stage would be to design the molecule synthesis route and then to have someone make the molecules. And there are literally hundreds of CROs around the world that can do custom synthesis. And as far as we know, there are really no checks and balances on whether someone makes a pesticide or whether someone would synthesize a chemical weapon. Clearly there's many other uh, ingredients to this cookbook that uh, we haven't uh, exposed here in this presentation for obvious reasons. And as I mentioned at the outset, we're moving towards the point now where you may not even need a chemist in the future, but the robot automated synthesis approaches um, may be able to uh, derive these types of molecules quite readily as well. So we could get to the point where these tools could produce uh, these types of molecules without a human in the loop. So there are implications. Obviously, um, we've had several months since we did this uh, test case uh, to think about this further. Um, we did not explore how to make any of the molecules, uh, the synthesis themselves, but the technologies are out there that could potentially be used to circumvent um, the synthesis of precursor molecules that are ultimately used to make known chemical weapons. And so that's something perhaps that hasn't been considered. Um, we didn't try to make anything else besides VX, but these types of approaches could be used for literally any molecule. Um, and I think now that these technologies are out there as open source, the tools could be used by literally anyone with minimal knowledge of chemistry to do something very similar to what we did. Um, and this may hint that we need to somehow lock down the data sets or the tools that we're uh, making available. Um, and this is something obviously that would be important to prevent the malicious use. And there is precedent uh, for locking down technologies such as GPT-3. Uh, this has been previously locked down through an API to prevent abuse. Um, and then more recently, this um, uh, API-based lock, lock and key mechanism was relaxed in November. So this may be a, a way forwards uh, where people that were genuine could request the API key and then freely use the models. So in summary, um, hopefully I've highlighted in this uh, brief presentation, the potential that we could use these AI machine learning technologies to create massive numbers of chemicals that are synthetically reasonable. Um, obviously we would use them ordinarily for drugs and consumer products, et cetera. And the advantage of these tools is that instead of having to physically make all of the molecules, we can make the ones that look the best and score the best. And these tools can be plugged into the automated design hardware that is being created. Um, and so the next stage will be to uh, other groups, obviously to demonstrate that these tools can be uh, integrated in this way. But we have to think about the unintended consequences of these technologies that we're making available, um, whether that's for making chemical weapons, um, or illicit drugs, um, there's clearly a potential here with the technologies that we have to in some way control. And this could have uh, really quite large consequences for the industry currently. Uh, we're seeing a lot of visibility for AI alongside the pharma industry, and it really just takes probably 
um, one example of this um, outside, which may have a large reputational risk for the, for the industry. And without being too alarmist, um, I think this highlights the potential dark side of the technology. And so it's critical that we keep humans in the loop. Um, we can obviously erase what we've done in terms of these were virtual molecules. We never actually physically made anything. Um, and so I think this really points us now to having more discussion at conferences. This is not something that I've previously seen discussed in, in the sphere that I normally inhabit. Um, and I think we need to bring more of a ethical guidelines into this area. And lastly, I would just like to say that this misapplication of technologies uh, or potential for misapplication may not be so far fetched. And obviously it got me thinking about how um, technologies have been uh, illustrated in uh, popular movies over the years. And obviously it's not too far of a jump to think that maybe in the future, James Bond may be uh, battling an AI generated chemical biological weapon. And with that, I would just like to acknowledge Fabio Urbina from our, our group that uh, generated this example and uh, Philippa uh, and Cedric who have been instrumental in making me think a lot more about this and the implications. And obviously I'd like to thank the NIH that have funded us for applying and developing our technologies for healthcare related applications. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation, uh, Sean, and for getting us off to such uh, a terrific start when we were putting this panel together, um, which is on science and security. We, we thought what better way to start us off than, or what more fitting way to start us off than um, from the perspective of a scientist. Uh, and, and you certainly uh, delivered, you know, thank you so much for this really engaging um, and, and very personal uh, story that you tell about how you first got involved in security issues, became aware of the dark side, going from AI produced drugs to, to AI produced biochemical weapons. Um, I had the privilege of, of being in the room when you first told this group of um, fairly senior um, biosecurity and, and chemical security experts about this experiment. And I still remember the kind of the jaw drop that everybody had when you said, yeah, actually, it was we flipped the switch and within just a few minutes we had a whole range of toxic uh, chemicals uh, some even worse than, than vx so um thank you uh, so much uh, for that sean and we'll come back with with more questions um after uh, the, the the next uh, two sets of, uh, of of speakers so our next speaker is um kathleen vogel kathleen is professor and interim director in the school for the future of innovation in society very wonderfully grandly titled um, at Arizona State University. Uh, Kathleen holds a PhD in biophysical chemistry from uh, Princeton University. She has served previously in the US Department of State as Jefferson Science Fellow and also as a William C. Foster Fellow. Um, I've known Kathleen for uh, many years. She is um, a wonderful person, extremely um, bright, scholar, uh, incredibly generous. Um, she's been doing really, really wonderful innovative research for, for years, especially on the intelligence side, on the life science side, uh, more recently on the AI side as well. Uh, she's been a fellow at the Turing Institute just uh, up the road. And I thought I would just give a very, very brief plug, Kathleen, for um, your very recent endeavor, this um, triple volume, Oh, it doesn't even show up very well. Uh, this triple volume of uh, the non-proliferation review in honor of Ray Selinskis, um, an absolute giant in chemical and biological weapons and who many of us on the call um, will have known personally or known of and who sadly passed. Um, my copy arrived just, just last week and it's just, as I said, a triple volume, a stupendous amount of effort pulling all these authors together. So thank you so much for your efforts on that, Kathleen, and your continued 
um, you know, um, innovation and keeping us all uh, pushing at the boundaries of, of our research. I'm so excited you're here. Um, very much looking forward to what you've got to say. So with that, over to you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Philippa. That's such a nice introduction. And, and, and I appreciate you also showing that special issue. There were so many folks that were involved in contributions and it was a wonderful tribute to Ray Zelinskis. And so um, that was just a great project to be involved with. And thank you so much for being a part of this very special event, the 60th anniversary. Um, and what's interesting is I think is my talk is gonna really complement, I think what Sean um, has talked about earlier. We didn't coordinate talks at all, but um, uh, what I'm gonna sort of uh, talk about today actually really pairs very nicely, I think with some of the things that um, Sean was talking about. And, and my talk is gonna really focus on looking at sort of the life science and, and big data AI nexus and sort of how we think about that, um, you know, to what extent is it shaping or reshaping the security landscape now and into the future. And, and with that, my sort of my talk is going to focus more on how do we think about the social dimensions um, with these technologies. And as Sean just mentioned at the end of his talk, the human in the loop, how do we actually critically and deeply think about that even with the development and use of these technologies. And so just as a, a general kind of gist of my talk today, um, kind of the main theme to throw out there that I'm gonna put um, is um, the sort of quote, the common quote, the more things that change, the more they stay the same. Or rather I would say the more we need to consider past wisdom on how to assess the threat from emerging technologies. So take for example, um, things like tacit knowledge or know-how, things that, um, such as the hands-on way of making science and technology work in practice. Um, you know, over the past 20 years, um, and I think Sean sort of talks about or um, hits at this a little bit in his talk, there have been many aspects of uh, biological or even biochemical work that have become much easier to execute. Some things have become automated, some things have become routinized and standardized, but not everything. So the question I think still remains, what has become standardized, what has become automated, and what has not in a given scientific and technological process? I think those are still key questions, even with these new technologies coming on the scene that I don't think we have a really great handle on that in terms of assessing how then that maps on to uh, threats. Uh, another question I think that's still very interesting is what exactly is required for technology transfer? Yeah, and thinking both about not only the technical dimensions of that, but also the social dimensions of that. Um, I think these are still things that we don't often examine carefully in uh, present debates about threats related to emerging technologies. And even when we talk about new technologies um, and things becoming um, automated or routinized, um, even with new technology and new skills, there are often new kinds of know-how or tacit knowledge that connect to those new technologies. So for example, how do you, if things are becoming automated, how do you operate that piece of machinery? or that new tool or that technique. And if something breaks down or something goes wrong, how do you fix it or how do you figure out how to fix it or what went wrong to get it back on track? If an experiment goes awry, how do you troubleshoot it to figure out what went wrong? And then connected to that, what kinds of skills or disciplines are required to get those things to work in practice? Does it require one person that can do these things? Does it require a team of different kinds of people with different kinds of expertise? Um, these are all kinds of questions that I still uh, remain um, when we talk and look at the biotech landscape and um, how we might think about security threats into the future. And I think, again, um, we need to spend more time looking at, you know, the parsing out some of those questions uh, more carefully, more deeply. So with emerging technologies, um, I would still ask some of these same questions um, uh, that I have with past technologies. And then to really probe kind of what is different and also looking at what is the same, rather than assume that everything is changing with the march of time and with technology. Um, I think it's also really pertinent to, pertinent to examine kind of the continued hype around developments in the life sciences and emerging biotechnologies and, and kind of think about how do the stories, narratives um, that we see and that we experience, how does that play into our own risk perceptions about uh, bio threats or policymakers' perceptions about bio threats? Um, what are the stories we tell ourselves and others about bio threats? How and why do these stories matter? Are they grounded in, in reality or empirical data? Um, 
If so, how in what ways? If not, then how is it that these bio threats still retain currency in different ways? Um, who or what might be shaping kind of how these narratives are told or, or how they're circulating and for what purposes? So I think these, again, these are kind of questions we still need to ask, even uh, with uh, emerging technologies and in, in particular the biotechnology space. And so in my own work, kind of one area that I've been really interested in looking at is, um, and I think again, this touches at, um, some of what Sean has mentioned in his talk, is this whole interest, and it's been growing for, I would say, a few years now, um, kind of the digitalization of biology um, and, you know, how biological information is, is you know, increasingly digitalized and, and, again, how biological skills are becoming more automated um, to enable the sharing of knowledge practices and lab skills around the globe. And there's been a lot of different public and policy attention on sort of how this avalanche of new biomedical and life science big data coming from genome sequencing, a variety of different databases, electronic medical records, and other sources are going to usher kind of a new area of precision medicine that's going to reap a lot of different public health benefits. And, and kind of in tandem with that, you also see, again, a emerging focus with that on the potential nefarious kind of acquisition and use of this data by different kinds of actors. And I think this has been something that has also been talked about quite a bit in different intelligence, law enforcement, and, and different academic and and think tank settings. And, you know, some have highlighted how China-based hacking groups have been responsible or strongly implicated in, in several different kinds of hacking incidents in the United States involving biomedical big data. Um, others have observed how Chinese hackers have attempted to obtain data from, for example, clinical trials and scientific research studies, as well as intellectual property involving medical devices. And, and it's still very unclear what specific motives are behind some of these attacks, for example, whether they're for purely economic or industrial gain, um, or whether there might be a darker purpose, for example, um, to aid uh, China's um, growing security apparatus. Um, in June 2000, uh, 2021, uh, the Biden administration signed a new executive order regarding the threat posed by China to U.S. information technology systems and digital data. And you can see that these developments point to, a, a, over time, a growing concern over China as a U.S. strategic competitor, national security threat in this kind of space, in this nexus of, of data and information technology. I think it is clear kind of if you look at, at um, sort of uh, what's been happening in China that China has sought to increase its biotech capability. I would say over the past 15 years, there have been very specific government directives along this front. Um, and the Chinese government has made biomedical big data a national priority and they've launched a um, billion dollar sort of initiative in 2016 to essentially um, developing this area. And so when we sort of, again, look at these um, Chinese biomedical hacking attempts, this could be an effort to try and get biomedical innovation on the quick and cheap. It could be something that China's trying to do. But I think we still need to, if that's still a concern, I think some, we still need to be asking the questions, how and in what ways has China actually been able to use this data for economic or security gain? Um, how easy or difficult has it been for China to potentially accomplish these goals? Um, what opportunities or challenges might China face in its biomedical hacking aims? And I think more centrally, the things that I'm most interested in is if, if you're, you're, you want to know the answer to those questions, then how might we more ac accurately assess these kinds of questions? What kinds of data, what kinds of analyses do we need to do to be able to, to get at those very, um, very serious kind of policy questions? Um, and I would say when I look so far um, at different kinds of studies or um, sort of uh, focal points uh, about the China threat related to biomedical big data, what, what I tend to see is that it tends to focus on these kind of discrete pieces of information. Again, the data itself, the, uh, for example, things like um, genomic data, patient data, like electronic health records that sort of may be acquired or passed, for example. And then sort of there tends to be an assumption then if China then has this data, it's only a matter of time. I think usually the assumption is it's soon uh, before China sort of overcomes the United States and becomes the new S&T global powerhouse in the biomedical biotechnology arena. And I think what's interesting is I kind of reflect back kind of in looking at this kind of discourse um, that's been made about this. This is very similar to other examples that we've seen in the 1990s and uh, to the present. Um, in which different intelligence and policy officials 
have pointed out, and I would say wrongly, to how advances in biology and biotechnology are going to lead to new and growing security threats. In the past uh, kind of examples, you see focus more on sort of access to materials, so access to viruses, bacteria, toxins, pathogens, synthesized pieces of DNA, for example, or the focus has been on, for example, um, acquisition of new kinds of biological techniques and technologies, PCR, synthetic biology techniques, genome editing, cloud labs. Um, you'll see, you've seen this a lot in sort of past discourse on this. Or you see a lot of concern about sort of uh, published materials and method sections of scientific papers and that information getting out and being acquired by someone um, by China, for example, to do harm. Um, and I've argued previously that this focus on these sort of material aspects of biotechnology um, is, is a very limited way to think about science and technology. It focuses only on the material aspects, and it doesn't really consider the social requirements and conditions that enable science and technology to work in practice in the real world. And I've, I've long argued kind of we need to consider these social dimensions of science, science and technology. Um, and if we don't, well, we're going to come out with a very erroneous way of thinking about what it takes for state or non-state actor to develop s and capabilities for harm. Um, and again, there are serious consequences. I think if we don't <clears throat> really think about these social dimensions of science and technology, I can point to a number of different flawed assessments from the Soviet and Iraqi bioweapons assessments in the past to the overhyped bioterrorism threat since the 1990s. And I would say various biosecurity concerns since that time where this focus only on the material or sort of the purely technical aspects of biology or biotechnology has led to sort of assumptions about threats that don't really match up with reality. And in the current concern over biomedical big data, I see the same focus again. Um, uh, and, and that again concerns me and, and, and makes me think we, we need to look at this a little bit more carefully. And I would say in, in terms of, um, you know, other scholarship or other folks that are doing work in this space. There have been some really interesting bioinformatics and big data researchers. I would say several in the UK as well as in Europe um, who have really tried to emphasize an alternative understanding and framework for how we think about these biomedical um, data threats. Um, this kind of research really focuses a lot more on the methods and assumptions involved in using biomedical big data for discovery the socio-technical challenges involved in extraction of knowledge from digital infrastructures, and the implications of choices in data curation for the outputs and uses of science and technology. Um, and this work is consistent with a sort of a broader range of bioinformatics scholarship that talks about the challenges of working with heterogeneous biomedical big data, that it's not a trivial task to harness these data for either useful or nefarious applications. There are often errors associated with some of this data. There are other data quality issues um, or compatibility issues that require substantial data curation and preparation before they can actually be used in practice. And so the, the crux of this kind of scholarship focuses on the challenges involved in creating, transferring, and using data for the production of knowledge that can lead to any, any type of biomedical application, whether we're talking about a positive and beneficial application or a more nefarious one. And, and so the key point here really is that of understanding big data, and I would extend this to saying understanding the security threats of biomedical big data, we always need to be think how this is this related to the social context of science and technology um, and the social context of how we generate and use and transfer biomedical big data. So it's asking fundamental questions, not only about the data, but about the who, who has collected and curated the data? What are their skills and expertise? How have they collected the data? How have they saved the data? Under what conditions and in what context have they done so? Um, how have they stored the data? Um, and I think these same questions could also be asked, let's say, for those who might be on the receiving end of biomedical big data. Um, and then asking a further question of what's required then to translate the received data to work in a new context um, and to be used uh, in, in a practical application. Um, data scientists are well aware that more data is creating even more complex data ecosystems to curate, manage, and navigate. Um, and whether biomedical big data can translate into the touted benefits argued by precision med medicine advocates or whether it translates into more and varied kinds of security threats really depends on kind of these social sense-making processes involved with working with this data. Um, so we really need to kind of a more understanding of the social context of working with biomedical big data 
um, to really get at a more grounded understanding of whether state or non-state actors that we're concerned about how they might be able to use this data in practice. Um, so again, I think we need to kind of really look more carefully kind of at the social dimension of biomedical big data. Um, you know, if, I think for to better inform decision makers uh, about these kind of security threats, we need new kinds of research questions. We need sort of new resources to enable kind of research agendas focused on these socio-technical dimensions of biomedical big data. Um, and, you know, this would really enable one to kind of parse out more carefully how and under what conditions could certain actors of concern utilize biomedical big data to pose economic or, or security threats um, to the US or to other countries. Um, so I do think we do need to spend more time and attention on looking at this increasing digitalization of biology, but I would say we need to put more emphasis looking at kind of the social context uh, of developing, working, using, and transferring this kind of data and what that looks like. Um, just to sort of get to close here, one other issue that I just wanted to throw in for conversation if folks were interested in talking about uh, actually connects to the special issue that Philippa um, showed just at the very beginning of, of my introduction. And uh, for me, this relates to an issue that I have been in, uh, more concerned about in recent years is about the, the pipeline of, of the next generation of experts, uh, biosecurity experts, um, and really trying to cultivate that uh, um, just across the globe. Um, as Philippa mentioned with the passing of Reza Linskus, and I would say in addition over the past few years, the biosecurity community has lost several leading biosecurity experts um, through death, through retirement. Um, there's a lot of knowledge that um, is, is passing from this field. And um, we need to find more ways, I think, to re retain and maintain not only the lessons um, of these past experts and, and how to impart those to kind of future generations and also to bring in um, diverse new generations of folks to work in this field. Um, so this is something also that I'm concerned about as you know, we look at um, the future uh, of the security landscape. How do we increase the pipeline? How do we find more diverse um, uh, folks to enter into the field? Um, and to be able to sort of meet, interact, learn from other, and build these kind of networks that can help us in advance of anticipated as well as unanticipated biological events that we might need to think about in the future. Um, so just wanted to kind of end on that. Um, curious if folks want to talk about the pipeline issue, I would definitely welcome conversations around that. So thank you. Great, many thanks, um, Kathleen, for your uh, for your talk and and the reminder to the reminder to mention uh, to venture um, beyond just the material uh, dimensions of of technology, but also to think about the many social questions that frame how we think about biomedical big data, but also technology more broadly. That you know, and how that can sometimes be um, overlooked. Um, a reminder to everyone to. Um, uh, start sharing their uh, questions. We've already uh, received a few. We're taking them on the Q&A channel. You can get access to it by uh, using the lower bar of your um, Zoom window. We will collect these and then bring them um, to the panelists for a discussion. Uh, but before um, we do that, let me introduce our third uh, panelist, Dr. Uh, Tim um, Stevens. Um, Tim is a senior lecturer in global security in the Department of um, War Studies um, and head of the Cybersecurity uh, Research Group. Um, his research focuses on the politics and geopolitics of cybersecurity. Um, and a plug to his current project, project he's currently writing a book um, on the international political economy of cyber uh, risk. Um, Tim is a fellow um, at the Research Institute for Social technical cyber security um, and the Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers uh, in Paris. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tim, for uh, joining us and over to you. Great, uh, thanks Hassan, uh, thanks Philippa, and also to Sean and Kathleen, who I think um, touched on quite a few issues that, uh, that I was gonna mention actually, and, and, and will continue to do so um, during uh, this short presentation. Um, so, it's interesting, I think, sometimes to reflect upon the fact that when we think about cybersecurity, we still talk about things like the internet as being emerging technologies. Um, we've had general purpose computers now for at least 80 years. 
we've had the internet for 50, in its, at least in its initial original forms, uh, the web's 30 years old. Um, and, you know, is cybersecurity this thing that's meant to be securing those networks, of, uh, those computer networks and systems? Is, is, what we, how is it, in what sense has it emerged? Well, what it very clearly is, uh, in a couple of very important ways. First is we haven't worked out how to secure it. And second is that this thing, this informational substrate for the world is growing in complexity and sophistication all the time. Um, and if you layer on top of that, the usual suspects like big data analytics, blockchain, AI, quantum, and so on, you've got this informational universe, if you like, cybersecurity is attempting in some way to secure precisely so as to facilitate the types of research we've just heard about. So this is a constantly evolving, changing, very dynamic field of practice, uh, obviously, but also a policy and therefore of research. And I sometimes reflect on how difficult it can be in teaching and keep up with, with things that have happened literally yesterday. Um, uh, we think about the unfolding crisis in Ukraine, for example, which I'll return to later. But cybersecurity has, has come out of a very specific place in terms of Traditionally, it would have been information security. So securing data, uh, making sure that people can access information systems uh, to keep you know, proprietary data or secret information secure from prying on, uh, keeping it confidential, making sure the data was, uh, had some integrity and could only be accessed by the people that were meant to access it. The cybersecurity, there's something much bigger, I think, than that. And even though you'll hear people say, basically, it's exactly the same as information security, I disagree. And I think the way that it's been couched in policy and strategy for quite a few years now tells us that it's not just about information security. It's not just about that protective function that InfoSec information security has, has traditionally had. It's something much more proactive, something that tries to intervene in the world in very different ways through using and exploiting computer networks and systems. We can think that it's being used as a vehicle for certain forms of war and warfare. Uh, it's certainly uh, a platform for intelligence and for espionage, both strategic uh, espionage and uh, industrial espionage. S cybercrime uh, is the massive problem. Criminals have found computer networks. Of course, the internet is the, the, the kind of signal um, best known information system, but criminals are finding this a fantastic way of generating revenue. Um, terrorists always use it, but also use it for various uh, uh, means and a whole range of other actors. But they're all trying to exploit this informational substrate for their own strategic, economic, political uh, gain. And this is having some interesting effects on business as usual uh, at the national level and, of course, also at the international level, which is really where my comments are, are going to sit. So I just wanted to draw attention to well, sort of three, main, three main ideas that just sprung into my mind earlier, and there are lots more. Um, and these are, these are quite high level, and hopefully we'll get into some of those in, in the Q&A. So the first is really this idea that <clears throat> cyber, I call it that, not everyone likes that term, um, but this is how people are referring to it in policy, really is destabilizing some traditional binaries when we think about international life, and indeed about national security and so on as well. The first is that, you know, this is not an environment in which the state is operating uh, on its own. Uh, a, a whole range of non-state actors involved in this environment. I mentioned criminals a moment ago and terrorists, um, but it's also you and me. Uh, we are, in some sense, agents of security. We're constantly being asked to make sure that we patched our systems, we don't download that, we don't go to that website and so on. We're agents of security too. But of course, there's also the, the huge inf influence of the private sector. We quite often work very closely with governments. Um, uh, we also have academia and civil society, working in various ways to kind of understand this environment or to promote same forms of uh, safe practice or privacy through uh, privacy activism and so on but the private sector as i just mentioned this, this is these are the people who own and operate the infrastructure they're the people who sell us our products they're the people who sell and maintain products for government uh, and they are hugely influential actors in this space um, so that public private division is, is further complicated you know you have act, various actors from each side of that putative divide, divide, in fact, very much blurring um, that binary. There's hybrid arrangements through public-private partnerships, all sorts of um, cooperation and coordination. And the private sector is very much wrapped up in the, the idea that the private sector can provide solutions to a lot of our cybersecurity problems. The whole inside-outside, when we think of the state, is also further blurred. You know, the, the global internet is exactly that. It's global. Its material infrastructure extends into space, under the oceans, and across every landmass 
uh, there is. And the, the, the idea that somehow you could retain, remain inside a national shell uh, and do cybersecurity has long gone because everything is so interconnected. And I'll return to that, that theme in a moment. And as I said, this other binary between protection and exploitation, again, uh, has, has disappeared. Um, because quite often it's the same technology being used for both those, those, those efforts, uh, dual use, or perhaps even multiple use, it's the same technology. And, and you know, at that international level, when we think in the Department of War Studies about differences between war and peace, we all know people who work in this field that, you know, it's not quite that simple. But cyber really complicates that because of all sorts of issues around anonymity, attribution, plausible deniability, and so on. And, and Lucas Keller at Oxford does this, this fabulous word, unpeace, to describe the state of play that's very much characterized by the use of cyber capabilities. Um, so destabilizing those binaries. The second main theme is, is these issues of dependence and interdependence. And as we've just heard from Kathleen and, and, and from Sean, Sean mentioned you know, securing AI from malicious attack. And Kathleen was talking about securing intellectual property from, from Chinese state actors uh, who might wish to steal IP and use it potentially uh, or translate or convert that somehow into something of use to the Chinese project. Um, cyber, Computer networks and systems are themselves a critical infrastructure. They enable an infrastructure, something that supports a greater endeavor. And computer networks are doing this across multiple economic sectors. There is a dependence on these, these digital infrastructures. And this is why cybersecurity is in part so important, uh, because they have to be protected and secured from a variety of actors, and also, of course, from, uh, from accidents um, and from disrepair. You know, occasionally things have happened in the global networks that mean that. You know, people notice when they can't access Facebook for four hours. Sometimes, you know, that, that's just the way that a system has been misconfigured or somebody's pulled out the wrong plug or flipped the wrong switch. Things happen. And trying to develop resilience to those types of uh, activities is part of uh, what cybersecurity is all about. So cybersecurity is a form of security, but it's also a condition of other forms of security. You think about it as being a guarantor in some ways of national security, uh, of economic security. You cannot do innovation in a high-tech environment, unless you're able to secure your data. Uh, so it has a role in that too. Um, even in you know, nuclear security, we quite often hear about the, the cyber nuclear uh, nexus and what happens if nuclear command and control uh, systems are hacked in various ways. And there's a lot of work out there, people very concerned about that. space security. You know, some of the, uh, a lot of internet traffic, not the majority by any means, you know, it, it, it involves satellites, but of course those satellites themselves are information systems that have to be secured and so on and so forth. And of course, right down to the level of the individual when we think about human security. And the pandemic's actually shown this very well. It's also shown us quite how good in some respects cybersecurity is, but it's presented a whole new range of targets, some of which we've just heard about, for example, around vaccine research and so on. Um, but also as people have switched to working online, hybrid um, working arrangements like this one, you know, have to be secured uh, so that they can't be hacked or subverted um, uh, uh, as we go. You know, so when you ask what is cybersecurity for, um, what does it secure, you get a, a very complex answer, and it's not just about computer systems. And as Kathleen rightly said, and I agree with this entirely, and, and this informs my own work, there's a social aspect to this as well that's hugely important, as well as the technical one. So um, that's to the dependence angle. The interdependence angle uh, is this transnational aspect I mentioned earlier about infrastructure spanning continents and so on. Uh, that's the case. And that, what that does is not just that they're extended uh, across, uh, across space and time, as it were, they're also interconnected, which means that things that happen in one place can happen very rapidly in another. So you, if you're gonna take down an asset, for example, in one country, and you don't know quite what you're doing, there can be unintended effects and perhaps even blowback on your own territory. And this has happened in the past, for example, with Russian cyber operations. And that points to, to, the, to the, you know, when we think about the risk to these environments, not just um, kind of organizational risk for the institution or the organization, the firm, the company, but actually a systemic risk that's, that extends across jurisdictions uh, and, and is no respect, if you like, of uh, particular local political flavors or cultural aspects. This is a systemic infrastructural uh, risk that we need to pay attention to. And exploiting these networks can be both a, a source of security for a, a, a particular country, but also a source of insecurity and potential instability. We don't really know how to avoid, although we've been quite lucky so far, 
to avoid cascading failures in tightly interconnected digital networks and the critical infrastructures that rely upon. We don't quite know how escalation works when two countries are trying to duke it out or explore one another's networks. Uh, we don't quite know how to approach crisis management in this domain. Uh, and, and the unfolding test case at the moment, of course, is Ukraine, where we're seeing Russia, um, you know, we, we presume it's Russia based on, on, on our analysis. Uh, it's gradually kind of ratcheting up cyber operations against Ukraine, potentially softening up um, both the civilian uh, and government uh, for a potential incursion of some type. Um, and that really points to this third issue that I wanted to raise, which is this is fully political. Um, this is not just a technical proposition. And as I said, I agree with Kathleen in, in that sort of social respect. You know, this is as, as much as the internet and information systems are a fabulous tool for innovation, exploration, discovery, communication, and so on, um, and for economic gain, they are also a military and intelligence domain. And states see strategic benefit in investing and in developing institutions and capabilities. Some of those capabilities, of course, which may be characterized as af offensive in nature uh, uh, rather than just defensive. And these are becoming rapidly and have been for some years now an issue, not just for national policy, but for international policy, law and regulation, uh, but also for global governance about how we how we govern this this space. And it's, it's very, very difficult um, to do so. Uh, one of the key battlegrounds here is about developing norms for responsible state behavior, uh, where you essentially have a competing diplomatic tracks at the United Nations, one sponsored by the US effectively and the other by Russia and China very geopolitical, very ideological, and some people are calling this part, you know, an aspect of the new Cold War. But this has been going on since the late 90s. Um, and you know, who determines, for example, the technical protocols uh, that make the internet and other technologies work is very important. And what's at stake essentially there um, is, you know, do we bake in democracy into our technology or do we, do we, do we uh, uh, found um, new technological standards uh, on authoritarian ideals? That is what is uh, what's at stake in some of those discussions. So just to conclude, my, my personal view here is that that cyber, um, if you want to call it that, it, it is potentially quite destabilizing, uh, certainly to the way we think about international war. Uh, but it could be worse. I mean, we've let to, yet to see anyone die directly through cyber means, uh, for example. However, that should not be the sole criterion for evaluation of an emerging or a set of emerging technologies. You know, there's no direct loss, loss of life on a, on a regular level from nuclear weapons either. Uh, it doesn't mean there isn't a problem set for nuclear weapons. And there certainly is a problem set for cyber, uh, social, economic, political, technical, cognitive, psychological, uh, the list goes on. And also the one, one of the issues I just you know, finally raised in respect of, of, of cyber is that you know, one of the issues is epistemic. Um, uh, rather than just being a technical. It's the infrastructure that facilitates misinformation, disinformation, breeds uncertainty, um, engenders erosion of trust in institutions and in infrastructures. You know, what do these do to political stability in turn, uh, both at national and international levels? And we've seen this in the last sort of five years or so um, <clears throat> in numerous examples. And I guess the meta issue, and I will close here, uh, Philippa, is that you know is whether this hyperconnectivity that is uh, that is facilitated and is you know, integral to, if you like, the very kind of uh, nature of the information systems that we built, is whether this hyperconnectivity is actually good for the human species at all. Um, there are huge operations cooperation, some of which we've heard about in terms of biomed uh, uh, in the last hour or so. But also in generating and, and sort of uh, facilitating this some form of global cognitive malaise, and I don't wish to come off as a luddite here, but I do think this is a uh, an issue that's that's really worthy of consideration, and it's something that I think again speaks to this issue that Kathleen raised, which is that um, when we think about computer networks and systems and information and data, we have to think about the social as much as the technical. Um, I guess that's my exam question, but um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Tim. That was really fantastic. Thank you also for stepping up uh, for the home team. Uh, really fantastic to be able to showcase some of our own um, scholars uh, in the department at these uh, seminars um, and events that we're that we're that we're hosting. Um, I really enjoyed uh, your talk, Tim, and I continue to learn from you. Uh, cyber is, as you know, an area I'm not so familiar with, and you present it very clearly and it's um, really very enjoyable to listen to. 
we've come to the point where we are now asking you to uh, ask questions. What are your major uh, concerns, uh, questions, things that you take away, took or took away from the um, presentations we've had? Please do use the Q and A function. We've already had a fair few questions in there. We'll get to those uh, in a minute. Please do also join the conversation uh, on Twitter using the Emerging Tech and uh, hashtag and the War Studies sixty um, hashtag. Um, from my own perspective, uh, one of the things um, that spoke to me in the conversations was really about the new actors and the new networks that are gaining currency in this in the space in the security landscape now, as compared to the 20th century. Um, even just on a personal level, I mean, uh, you know, a year ago, Sean, I, I don't think you were even imagining rubbing shoulders with this kind of security uh, crowd that you now have, right? Um, and so uh, it, it's even new actors in that sense, but also more broadly, new, the rise of different kinds of actors. We heard repeatedly through the, the conversations or the presentations, uh, talks, a, a talk about the private sector. Um, of course, there's another reason to, 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 that we wanted to in, invite uh, Sean in, you know, it is uh, a recognition and a signaling of that there are these new actors that need to be part of our conversations uh, and, and to have a seat at our tables. Um, Kathleen, you mentioned um, hackers. Uh, many hackers are of course state-based uh, uh, or state-supported, um, but there are also uh, others, you know, who hack, uh, who do it for no other reason than just to see if they can. Um, we got similar issues in the, the biospace where they're called biohackers uh, or amateur scientists who, who, who try stuff for, 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 for no, no, ne not necessarily malign, uh, with malign intent, um, but they are new actors who, with these emerging technologies, have can have quite powerful uh, consequences of, of some of the work that they're doing. So we're seeing all these new actors come in, and I'd be very keen to hear thoughts from the panel on on how we can enroll these actors in our project of safeguarding uh, national security, of, of safeguarding international security, how we can enroll them in disarmament and in arms control. Um, Tim, you mentioned uh, they could also provide solutions. We mustn't just look at how they make things more difficult for us. There are also solutions that can be brought from, from the, uh, from that, that could come from emerging technologies. Um, are there new levers of control? Uh, Sean, you mentioned reputational risk as a big factor for private industry. Can that be um, uh, used as a way of, of managing some of these uh, risks? So my very broad question, I guess, to the panel would be uh, along the lines of, of, of how can we think uh, about effective means to manage technological advances when we have these uh, using these new actors and how can we enroll these these new actors and and I hope um, you know your big message Kathleen about the social dimension bringing this down to how do we create linkages between um, linkages relationships and uh, networks between groups of people to build trust to build confidence uh, that what people are doing is uh, above board. I think all of that is really, really important. So those were just some of my um, rambling thoughts uh, as I was listening to, to, to these uh, presentations. I'll, I'll hand over to Hassan, who will also have um, share some of his thoughts with us, and then we'll turn it over to, to the panelists to, to kind of um, give us some, in, some initial reactions from their side, and then we'll turn to the Q&A. Uh, and there's lots uh, at this point. So Hassan, over to you. Great, um, many thanks, um, Philippa and the panel. I want to ask the panel a slightly tongue-in-cheek um, question. I mean, rather than on technologies themselves, um, I just want to put the spotlight on our own understanding and appreciation um, of risk um, more generally. Uh, I mean, these and other technologies that have been discussed uh, on this panel clearly create uh, risks for sure. I mean, Sean's presentation is very clear in demonstrating that. 
But Kathleen and Tim also asked the question, what has actually really changed um, and what has remained the same? Uh, and I wonder how we can appraise our tolerance of risk in this uh, context. Has it actually decreased somehow? Do you think that our tolerance to risk um, has changed in relation to these um, new and emerging technologies? And therefore, I think the consequence would be pushing forward a control agenda at the fore of our discussions when we're talking about um, these technologies. Uh, so that's um, my question um, to the panel um, and over to you. Perhaps we can take we can take them in the order um, of speakers. So perhaps we can start with Sean and then move to Kathleen and, and Tim. Um, yeah, I, I am not, I'm not probably the best person to ask about risk tolerance. Um, ha I mean, having not even thought about the risk of these technologies previously, and I've been working in the field for over 25, 26 years. Um, and, and obviously using a computer, I would not really have thought of any risk of using that um, to, to do what I do. Um, but obviously now I am very aware of the risk of these technologies of the risk of even publishing any of the data sets that we put out there in the models. Um, and so now my, my risk tolerance, I think, has, has changed dramatically. Um, and obviously the reputational risk, as I, I highlight, I think, because there is so much money going into this area, um, that was my main concern, like reputation for all of these companies, if, if one of them goes awry. Um, and that's, that's where I'm coming from, I guess. So it's very, very narrow in thinking. I wasn't thinking the big picture globally. I was thinking very narrow. This industry is, you know, potentially could do itself um, a big harm if uh, some of these data sets and models get, get out there and um, someone misuses them. Um, let me see, lots of different things I could comment on. Let me see um, what I can comment on. Uh, I think from my perspective, in terms of thinking about the risks, um, there's a different kind of risk when you think about technology in isolation or in abstraction versus what it actually takes to get technology or scientific thinking to work in practice. Um, and I think oftentimes the in practice part and oftentimes how science or developing technology, there's so many things, so much troubleshooting, so, so much painful work that has to go into getting something to work in practice that's often not part of these conversations. And I think it is something to think about. And I think it does, if you think about some of these challenges um, that it does then tend to give you a different perspective on the risks. That's not to say that the risks go away or that we shouldn't be thinking about some of these technologies or new developments, but I think you also have to think again, ground it with empirics. And I think oftentimes in the security space, there's little of that. Um, actually studying, you know, for example, one of the things that I was looking at um, in Sean's presentation was some of the different scientific papers he posted and you sort of see the list of co-authors listed on some of these papers. And from my perspective, I'd be very curious then to understand how was that entire team involved in producing that knowledge? And for me, that is where you try and better understand what is a threat or what is a risk, is to try and get a sense of what is required on the people dimension, on the teamwork dimension, the troubleshooting dimension. And when you start getting at those, and that helps you then parse out what maybe could potentially really be a risk and, and um, be more at hand versus let's say another type of risk that would require an entire 20, 30 person team of people to accomplish with very specific skill sets. That's a very different kind of risk that you're talking about. And so from my perspective, I think we need to do more to parse out what is the, the sort of more quick and easy kind of work that might pose risks versus other kinds of risks that might require teams of people in much more complicated state level kind of, you know, over time kind of efforts that would be required. Um, in terms of just briefly on one of Philippa's uh, points on sort of these new actors and, and what can we do to engage, and I think, not that they were perfect, but I think the synthetic biology community is kind of an interesting one to look at, where there were, from the very beginning, um, when some of that work was starting, there was an attention to some of the security concerns, and, and they were very open to being engaged by 
security scholars, by law enforcement folks um, being involved in security conversations. But I think it also involved the security communities reaching out to them and, and finding ways to constructively engage with those communities. And you see similarly with them, um, you know, the iGEM, the International Genetic Eng Engineered Machines kind of effort where you had um, folks be engaged very early on in trying to get people to think about some of these ethical or security dimensions of the work. So I think there's always opportunity. It shows that there are ways uh, and there have been successful ways to engage different communities, new actors. And I think we need to probably be thinking of doing more of that. Um, however, that requires resources and personnel to do this. So that's also thinking as a, on, from the policy perspective, if you want law enforcement to engage or the intelligence community to engage, you're gonna have to provide resources, either human or uh, financial to allow that to happen. And um, also on the scholarly side as well. So those are just some comments I would have. Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, two enormous questions there. Uh, yeah, as Hassan mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm trying to write a book on cyber risk or digital risk. And I don't have a, set, a settled answer to your precise question. I think when you think about tolerance to risk though, um, the point about risk is that a risk doesn't exist until we identify something as a risk. Um, so at the moment in a deeply connected world, which science and technology are writ large and which global communication and global media are, are, are things in the, in the world, we have a greater knowledge, or, well, we think we have greater knowledge anyway, of risk. We understand that there are more risks and we are concerned about them. In a sense, I think given that the, the, the amount of risk, if you like, that does exist in the, in the contemporary world, we do have a greater tolerance towards it. Uh, or at least we're very selective in, in what we think is riskier than others. Most of us indulge in risky behaviours, um, but at the sort of high level political collective, we're, we're indulging in some incredibly risky behaviours, which we pretty much know the outcome in terms of species death and uh, ecological destruction, yet we, we, we do it. Is that tolerance to risk? Sounds a bit like it, doesn't it? Um, so, uh, I mean, Kathleen raised an interesting point about, you know, the empirics of this. It, it, it's really, really challenging. Because risk, if security is a way of securing what is known, risk is a way of managing the unknown. And um, risk is very forward looking in that respect. Yet to, to model the future, we have to use a data from the past uh, in a very actuarial sense. So there's all these kind of different strange dynamics operating across this, this time space of risk. Um, on the, on the act, new actors, um, it's a really live conversation in cybersecurity, it has been for quite a number of years, um, about how. Uh, they talk about the cyber skills gap, by which is meant people in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. We don't have enough of them. We don't have enough computer scientists, mathematicians, modelers, network engineers, you name it. So we need we need to pump all the money into STEM. I'm, I don't think that's necessarily the right approach. I think we need a much more diverse workforce that's going to try and work through the issues because they're not just technical. And I think we could probably all agree with that on this call. doesn't mean we don't need engineers and computer scientists. We do. We also need in the universities to encourage much more diverse um, uh, sort of skill sets and perspectives and disciplines and so on. And that needs to be translated into government policy um, and actually into funding, um, because in the UK it's exceptionally poor at the moment, despite the fact there's lots of people like me agitating for a much more diverse workforce uh, and, and actually have a respect for things that are outside STEM. Um, because you cannot properly serve a society unless the people who are doing it reflect what society looks like. And it's not just intellectual diversity there either. There's a whole range of protected characteristics that need greater representation in the cybersecurity workforce too, including in government. Great, many thanks um, to the panel. Um, we actually have 40, um, we're 45 minutes past the hour. We've got 15 minutes um, left. We've got plenty of uh, questions from our audience. Thank you so much for showing interest, providing interesting questions as well. Um, let's see how many rounds of questions we can take in the remaining 15 minutes. I'll try my best to um, condense a few of the, of, the question, of the questions and then put them back to the panel. And I appreciate um, quick responses to be able to go through as many as possible. I'll start uh, the first round and then Philippa perhaps can, can take us to the second round if, if, if there is um, more time. There are a lot of questions about uh, the different profiles of actors. Um, so there's a question about the private sector driving technological innovation, consumer-based, demand-based companies, 
um, and also rogue states and terrorists. Um, and again, I'm grouping some questions here together, but they all point to sort of like different actor profiles and the kind of question that raises for both innovation, risks, but also um, control. Um, and, and although some of these questions are, can be tied to certain technologies, and I think we can put them to the panel in, in general about you know, whatever technology they are specifically interested um, in. So basically, how does the private sector, consumer-based, demand-based companies, rogue states and terrorists, how can we think about these actors in terms of um, technological innovation risks, but also uh, control? Um, I think there is uh, an interesting and very broad question that I'd like to put to the panel about the opinion about the most dangerous emerging technologies at the moment. I'm interested to see what you um, you think of, of that, or maybe perhaps a different way of framing that question. Um, right, over to you. Perhaps we can start with the same order as well. So uh, Sean, Kathleen, and uh, then Tim. I, I'm kind of wary of, very wary now of thinking about even saying what I would consider as dangerous technologies, because um, I feel like uh, I've become a bit more paranoid now about what I put out there. I've maybe already said, I think maybe I've already said too much, right? We're all aware of what technologies are out there. And I think they all could potentially be misused, right? Whether that's AI, whether that's CRISPR, you know, some of the things that we think of as relatively innocuous um, could have potentially devastating uh, implications if they're misapplied. And I yes, I would never have thought that computational technologies alone would have such a potential impact. Um, and obviously alone, they are not going to kill you, right? That piece of code isn't gonna kill you, but it's what will come out of that code. That's just the next step, right? So that's maybe how we have to think about these other technologies too, right? So, you know, they may be just a stepping stone to get to the ultimate weapon. Um, so yeah, I would not want to single out any particular technology, whether that's biological, AI, chemical. I think they all could be equally as bad. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough question too. I, I would similar to Sean, I'm a little re reluctant to say one is, is worse than another. Um, but I guess I, from my perspective, um, I would probably look at it. And again, you're, you're, this ties back to your other comment about different kinds of actors and, you know, um, how they might connect to innovation or technology. And it just, when you said that, it reminded me of um, sometimes sometimes uh, we focus more on the technology. And again, this gets back to my main argument, which is focus on the social um, and not think about sort of other kinds of innovations that are not technology. And so for example, when I think about 9-11 and, and what happened there, when you talk to different terrorism scholars, they talk about that was an organizational innovation that allowed that and facilitated that. It wasn't a technological innovation. And I think we, I would say we probably need to be thinking more about those kinds of social innovations, even when we think about technology. So for example, if we think of particular technology might be used for harm, what is gonna be sort of the, the or maybe the organizational innovation that might facilitate that? Or for example, if there's something that truly does uh, remove humans from the loop, you know, looking at that more particularly and really thinking holistically about that. So um, oftentimes people think, okay, if it removes the human from the loop to get something to work, but what if that particular piece of technology breaks down? Would, would the person know how to fix that? And how do we again think about that aspect of when we talk about innovation um, uh, as well? So those are just some thoughts that come to mind. I also would be reluctant to, um, to talk about what is the most, but I, I, from my perspective, I would say we don't really have a good hand on that because we haven't really done the assessments or analysis that allows us to construct a spectrum of what is easier or more difficult to do that would be more of a concern to particular non-state actors. I, I've long arg argued we need to have sort of a map where you really parse this out and say, you know, what, what is a, a technological innovation that is simple and easy at hand that would allow for harm versus something that's much more sophisticated and, and complex. And, and I don't think we have that now. Yeah, it's, it's not a fair question to ask someone who consumes too much science fiction anyway. 
but um, it's it's uh, uh, but I I think the most dangerous technology is the ones we already have. Um, and I would say pretty much anything that's based off an internal combustion engine has proven to be absolutely lethal to life on Earth already. Um, so we've got a big problem to sort that out right now. But I mean, I, I do think that pretty much when we're thinking about emerging tech, uh, pretty much all of it converges on information. And it's that kind of manipulation of information that I think is actually in, in a kind of abstract but yet concrete sense is actually what's going on here. You know, there's a reason we've been calling ourselves knowledge economies and information societies since you know the invention of the uh, of the internet in the 60s and 70s is because it's real and it's really really important. And all the things we've heard about around AI, bio and chemical uh, invasions and so on, um, uh, you know, some quasi sentient grey goo escape, which is a lapse of laboratory safety, is as, is is as likely as kind of a deliberate kind of intervention by a malicious actor from outside. Um, you know, and all of that will come from something going wrong with the code of life. And uh, because we've made it like that. Um, and I know obviously lots of protocols and safeguards and so on, but it seems, you know, if there's a technology that's going to uh, be really problematic in the future, it's probably going to come from there. Even nuclear weapons are bad information, ultimately. Um, so that's my sort of particular bent, I think. But um, yes, it's a, it's a very difficult question to answer. Well, you all did a, a stunning job try, trying to get there. Um, there's a there's another a few questions in, in the chat. One is about do nation states need to do more to manage the threat of globalization of emerging technology? Um, there was another about um, let me see. Um, is there is there plausible room for redefining what a biological weapon is after 2021? Um, uh, presumably since since the pandemic. Uh, on that one, we have a great set of scholars from Kings who have argued exactly that point, saying, uh, tying it to disinformation and saying, well, if you are using, um, if you're using disinformation in a public health crisis, and you're ending up at a point where people don't know, uh, or they don't trust their doctors, uh, they are taking wrong medicines or they're refusing to take medicines and they're getting sick um, or people you are inciting violence against medical staff uh, resulting in casualties, um, then in effect, you, you are developing a different kind of biological weapon. So it's a different way of thinking uh, about biological weapons. But what I really wanted to come back to was this point about um, disinformation and and, and um, manipulation of information, because it seems to me that that is one of the cross-cutting issues uh, with all these different emerging technologies, right? Um, it, it, it's something that affects all of them. Um, and how do you think disinformation in your areas is affecting the shape of how the technologies are emerging, but also their impact on the security um, landscape? And, and Sort of related to that is, you know, disinformation uh, and misinformation is creating this, um, is part of creating uh, the crisis of trust that we're seeing in, uh, in science and in authoritative institutions. Um, how can we re re how can we start rebuilding that trust? Um, and, and my very final question uh, to you are, is really, um, are, you, are you hopeful about the future? Uh, or 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 are you not? Uh, so uh, again, I'm hope I hope I've served you a little platter of possible questions that you you can um, um, you know pick at uh, and and um, uh, or not as, as you will. We've got five minutes. I'll leave the floor open. Would one of you like to jump in so we don't pick on poor Sean uh, to start off the whole time? <laughs> Uh, Kathleen or Tim, would, would either one of you like to, to have an initial go at, of, at your final word? I'm happy to Thank give you. a couple of brief interventions. The first on, on disin, misinformation and so on in cyber. What's actually happened? I mean, before we got to calling everything misinformation, uh, around about 2016 in the US, we were calling it cyber enabled information operations, which tells you pretty much all you need to know there about the role of computers in that. They are the platform, they're the infrastructure that enables this stuff to be disseminated on a global scale. The problem with that, of course, is that people think that therefore there are technical solutions to the problems of misinformation and disinformation. 
Well, they're very few and far between, actually, because the problems aren't derived from technical problems in the first place. These are social issues. And not, obviously, they're co-constructed in various complex ways, but don't think that there's a technical solution to what are essentially social and political problems, because there aren't, not purely technical anyway. Um, but what we're seeing there, I guess, is, you know, it, it, the modernity came out of a, partly an erosion of religious authority. We're now seeing in part an erosion of secular authority. And, and that's really problematic because we thought we were doing quite well as high moderns, and it turns out we weren't. Maybe we were being a bit complacent, but what are we going to replace this with and how are we going to shore up trust? Or are we going into a different kind of regime of knowledge and understanding? I don't know. Am I optimistic about that or pessimistic? Well, you happen to be talking to someone who published a book about pessimism about three years ago. Um, so I think that tells you all you need to know. But I mean, Gramsci was right. Uh, you know, uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. So as an academic, being skeptic and slightly pessimistic, is not necessarily a bad thing, but you wouldn't want to lead all your life in that frame of mind. Thank you, Tim. Kathleen, Sean, do either of you have any um, points you'd like to come in? Final, final words? I, I would say that um, getting back to the uh, misinformation or disinformation, if we're building models that enable us to, say, design molecules, they're very dependent on the quality of the data that goes in to build the model. And so a lot of that data has already gone through peer review. But you could imagine uh, taking data from databases and some of that data was corrupted in some way. And so now the models that you build will no longer be reliable. They will no longer point you in the right direction, right? So it would be almost like a compass losing its ability to enable you to figure out which direction you're going. So I think that might be a challenge going forwards is if the databases that we use for good um, are corrupted in some way, that will then enable them not to work. And that's the only way I can think of disinformation impacting sort of, you know, my very narrow view of how we use AI. Um, and then obviously that will impact how they could be used for nefarious uses too. Yeah, the only thing I would just jump in, I do think this disinformation um, issue is fascinating. And I think it is gonna continue to you know, we're looking at sort of the security landscape. I think it's, we're still gonna to have to grapple with it, I think in the years to come in all kinds of different dimensions. And, you know, from what Sean mentions, you know, um, errors or corruptions in, in information that's stored in databases to sort of more nefarious types. Um, you know, it's, I think it's gonna be a persistent problem. Um, but I will say I, I am hopeful for the future. Um, you know, I, I think in part, because when I think about there's so many smart people working on these problems, including panelists um, and others that I just have hope that, you know, we're not gonna be able to avoid or prevent certain bad things from happening, but I think um, there are ways to sort of try to do what we can to, to better protect ourselves. So I, I actually am hopeful. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you for letting us uh, end on such uh, on, on a high note. Um, um, from me, a very, very warm thank you to all of our uh, speakers. It's been really wonderful to, to hear your thoughts, your perspectives. Uh, it helps us to think further and critically. So thank you so much um, to you for, 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 your, for speaking. Uh, and thank you also to Lizzie and the wonderful comms team here at, at War Studies. I'll quickly hand over to Hassan uh, to close out. Uh, the webinar. Great. Thank you so much. We are 8 uh, p.m. on the dot. Thank you so much for our um, panelists for sharing uh, thoughts for my uh, colleague uh, and co-director of CSSS, uh, Philippa, and behind the scenes, uh, Lizzie from the War Studies Department, who made all this technically possible, uh, no pun intended. Um, I also want to thank um, our audience for uh, contributing excellent questions um, to the discussion. And please note this event was part of the series to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the War Studies Department. Uh, more events are coming up. Um, one on how do we navigate crisis in international order. And another, uh, guess what, on health security. Uh, how do we respond to growing threats to global health security. Please check our website for more information on both events. Um, thank you all for joining us um, today uh, and good evening to you all. Thank you. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you. <laughs>